This Week in Radio Tech, episode 201, is brought to you by the Telos ProStream streaming appliance. Audio in, great sounding, robust audio streams out. Multiband audio processing by Omnia. Authentic Fraunhofer Codex plus metadata encoding, all in a one rack appliance. The Telos ProStream on the web at telos systems.com. Who better to predict radio's future than a radio futurologist? James Cridland advises radio's leaders across the globe on radio's multi-platform future, the effect of smartphones on radio listening, and radio's place in social media, plus radio DNS. James explains what it's all about. Chris Tobin joins me for a lively discussion with James Cridland. Welcome in. It's time for This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host, and so delighted that you're here. I'm glad I'm here because this is going to be a terrific show. It's our 201st episode. I mean, whoever thought we'd, made a pa- we'd make it past 20 episodes, and here we are 201 episodes later. Um, our usual co-host, Chris Tobin, is on his way in right now, stuck in traffic, so he'll be along shortly to re-ask the questions that I ask of our guests here in the first few minutes. Our show is brought to you by the Telos ProStream. I have one right here. We'll talk a little bit more about it later. It is a streaming, a stream encoding appliance and audio processor, and it handles metadata, too, so we'll tell you more about that as we move along. Our guest, I'm delighted to have this guest here. I don't know how I have missed this guy at various conferences and, and shows uh, throughout the throughout the years, I've been going to NAB for 27 years now myself. I don't think uh, James is quite that old, but let's welcome in our guest, James Cridland <laughs> from the UK. Hi, James. Welcome in. Hey, uh, greetings from the mother country. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm you know. On one hand, I'm kind of sorry we're broken off from you guys. On the other hand, it may be a good thing. So, <laughs> taxing is too much for tea. That was the whole deal. So exactly. James, I came across um, you, I, uh, your name from some articles you'd recently written. And, uh, you know, actually, our, we had a guest on several times. In fact, he's due to come on again, Skip Peasy. Um, I, I think Skip. you, yes, you well. probably know Skip. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Skip's been a friend of mine for a long time. And Skip's, like I said, due to be on again sometime here soon. He was talking about Radio DNS quite some time ago. And I really am not sure I got the concept then. Generally, yeah, radio, pretty display, lots of pictures and what's going on. So it's you know some good accompaniment to go with your radio. But I got a feeling there's, there's maybe even more to it than that. So first of all, uh, tell us about yourself. And you call yourself a radio futurologist. What is, how do you position yourself in this radio industry? <sighs> So I call myself a radio futurologist. It's a it's a made up word, um, uh, and um, I've, I, my history is I've worked for um, commercial radio and the BBC uh, here in the UK. Uh, it's my twenty fifth year in the industry uh, this year, and uh, for the last uh, four or five years, I've been consulting different radio companies uh, across Europe and the US, uh, really helping them understand what's coming up next um, and what new technology means. To the radio business, because you know it's clearly uh, a time of massive, massive change, and it's hugely important that we understand what new technology can actually do for us, um, and make you, and make radio relevant for the kind of generation that's growing up with uh, smartphones and Pandora and um, and YouTube and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Well, you know, for decades, radio kind of remained the same. You know, we started life out with AM radio uh, almost mm. uh, almost 100 years ago. And then along came FM radio with, a, uh, at least in the U.S., a quick band change from the 40 megahertz area to the, you know, 90, 100 megahertz area. A- and then along came MTV in 1980 that was going to kill the radio star. Um, didn't <laughs> quite, but then MTV didn't quite. didn't is no longer what it was, so it's not no longer a threat in its current form. And then we we kept hearing about how all these different technologies would kill radio, and and radio I don't know to my view hasn't changed much. We have here in the U.S. we have HD, and mm-hmm. a, sure a number of stations are involved with that. Some people love it, most people don't know it exists. In the UK you have DAB, and some other parts of the world you have DAB plus. Mm-hmm. And uh, I find myself listening to a, a lot of podcasts instead of live radio, um, except when there's bad weather around. I, I'll tune in, in the radio. So kind of mm-hmm. you know, as a futurologist, wh- how do you apply where we've been in the past to what you think things are going to in the future? 
I mean, I think there's a uh, when you whenever you start talking about what the future of radio is, you kind of have to start talking about what radio is um, for a start. So when you when you're talking about what radio is, you're you're um, probably beginning to have to think. Okay, well, radio is um, is it say uh, generally live, or if it's not live, it's involving humans and it has mm-hmm. some kind of connection with the, w- w- with somebody. So, uh, in terms of things like uh, Pandora, in terms of things like YouTube, I don't really call those radio. They're a different experience. They might be taking uh, audiences away from radio and consumers might think that they are radio. But from my point of view, um, that kind of thing is a different experience, a shared human connection where mm-hmm. you can actually hear stories and things that, that are relevant to you. That's what I think radio is. So I think, you know, the first thing is understanding what kind of business we're in. If we're in a business of uh, an algorithmic uh, jukebox that sits there and plays me songs that I might uh, I might like, then that's great, uh, and there's n- nothing wrong with that. But actually, if you're there thinking, okay, well, what is what is radio? Radio's people, radio's connections, radio's stories, and that story might be uh, what the breakfast jock got up to last night, uh, or it might be s- something far more um, far more c- cerebral on uh, NPR or whatever it is but that's really what radio is all about so i think you you start there and then you and then you work out okay well um does it actually matter where people are consuming radio from the consumer's point of view it doesn't really um and if you're listening to radio online you're listening to radio over hd or dab or uh, drm or any of this other uh, mechanisms of getting radio or indeed uh, sirius xm um that's still radio and it's important that radio, in whatever guise it's in, uh, is still relevant in terms of the content. So content is one of the most important things here. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, we, you and I were talking a couple hours ago before the show, uh, James, about, about mm. um, how radio, how I, at least I perceive radio as being interesting or uninteresting in various places and, and, and how you perceive that. You're in the UK. Um, and I told you this story. I, I subscribed uh, to some Google News alerts, right? This is easy to set yeah. up, and you can find out news from around the world and what's going on. And so um, uh, when I subscribe to Google News alerts to get alerts daily on stories that have to do with uh, FM radio as a keyword, AM radio as a keyword, um, uh, I'm sure there are other maybe even better uh, uh, keywords to use. But so many stories that show up in my inbox about the radio industry are not from the U.S., at least not the exciting ones. The exciting ones are from the UK and quite a few from Australia and a bunch from India where it seems like there's still a lot of excitement about radio. Now, maybe I'm just, uh, maybe I'm just being too negative on, on radio in the U.S. because I'm tending to not listen very much. Um, uh, and, and So t- how, how do you perceive that radio is more engaging or as engaging in the UK as it is here in the U.S.? I mean, I think I think radio in the UK and radio in the US is pretty similar in terms of the amount of people who tune in every single week. Uh, we have around ninety percent of the uh, of the adult population who tune in uh, every week, and that figure is much the same in the, in the US as well. Um, mm. So, in terms of in terms of the amount of use of uh, radio, and that goes with pretty well any Western um, any Western. Uh, country. So you can see that, you know, radio itself is still incredibly strong. Um, what radio everywhere in the world has an issue with is the amount of time that uh, younger people are, are spending with radio is going down. So they're still tuning in every single week, and that's a great thing. But the amount of time that they're spending with radio uh, is going down. In the UK, it's gone down by about 20% t- t- TSL uh, loss in mm. the last uh, 10 years or so. Now, you, uh, I suppose that there's two sides of that. One side of that is, does that um, is that actually massive? Twenty percent in the last ten years. We didn't even have YouTube ten years ago. We didn't have iPhones ten years ago. Uh, mm. And frankly, most people didn't even have iPods ten years ago. Yeah. So you know, is is that a bad thing? But obviously, what it does show you is that the future of radio um, needs to have a better experience uh, if it's still going to be re- relevant to the type of people who are walking around with. Um, beautiful full color screens, um, you know, walking around with, uh, you know, a beautiful experience that they can get on, on a mobile phone where they've got, mm-hmm. you know, beautiful images and everything else. 
And then you're there on a mobile phone tuning into FM radio. If you can get FM radio on your mobile phone, all it says is 98.3. That's all it says. You know, you don't, you don't get a very good user experience uh, out of traditional FM radio. And mm. so I think part of the conversation uh, around where the future of radio lies is actually making sure that the user experience of radio is just as good as the user experience of things that would take... Um, pairs of ears away from radio. So things that, like Pandora yeah. and things like uh, uh, Spotify and, uh, and RDO and all that kind of stuff. Now, now that, that's where the change is because it used to be for decades that the content, the audio content of what was on the radio was mm. enough to engage, excite, and interest listeners, right? And because of these competitors, I, I hear you at least alluding to, well, maybe it's not enough anymore, or maybe there's, because these other shiny, shiny things are available, uh, radio needs to engage in these same shiny, shiny things. Uh, like if I'm, you know, I'm stuck on my, on my Facebook a lot, right? Uh, okay, hmm. wife is driving the car. I don't do this while I'm driving. Usually, uh, and uh, and and you know something new yeah. on Facebook pops up every twelve and a half seconds, you know, and I'm just so rabid about going out and reading it and finding out what it is, or or my Twitter feed, and and, and so, uh, gee, I I feel like my smartphone has given me a short attention span. Um, uh, I do it, enjoy it, listening. It gives quite a lot, but 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 I mean, there again, if you if you have a look at radio, mm -hmm. what's brilliant about radio is um, not that you have a three hour long show or four hour long bre breakfast show. It's yeah. all of the little bits of content in there, and I think uh, one of the th first things that we can do is to think of ourselves as radio broadcasters as producing short form content rather than a three four hour long show. You know, mm -hmm. you can take mm -hmm. what um, what Howard Stern does or what Rush Limbaugh does or uh, what Ryan Seacrest does, and you can actually cut that up into small, discrete uh, sections. That's actually what they do, and that's actually what they excel in, because they know that people uh, will only be tuning into the radio for 10, 15 minutes at a time. They won't stay with that show uh, for all four hours or five hours or six right. hours. Right. You know? so, so actually thinking about what you do with the great content that you have and also thinking about what you can do with that great content afterwards. So, you know, clearly this is a this show here is a show which is live, but it's also a show that you can then take and package and use as as your podcast. You can use uh, in video form, you can use in audio form. You know, this is really very much where radio's headed in terms of being able to take great pieces of audio um, and package those up to allow people to consume that either live but live in a more uh, enriching experience if they want to do that or also on demand so take some of the best bits of the interviews that you have you know if you, if you do a search on uh, YouTube for Howard Stern as I did the other day you get loads and loads and loads of, of clips of interviews of clips of uh, Howard Stern talking to people all packaged up in terms of video um, and all looking really nice. And that all um, leads back to uh, Howard Stern's brand, leads back to mm. Sirius XM's brand, of course, you know, and, and, and there's a lot of that going around. And I think that's not taking anything away from radio. That's not making radio into crappy TV because that's the last thing that we want. It's actually making the best of the content that we have and allowing you to do other things with that content to reach more people um, with the great content that you're already making. You know, and that's and that's hugely important. There are radio stations, for example, um, here in the UK that run uh, video all the time just in the studio. So it's completely automated. Um, it works on uh, where the noise of the microphone is coming from uh, and uh, completely automated. And so you know exactly um, uh, you know, the cameras automatically switch. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what that, what that essentially means is that you can then have video of anything really interesting that happens in your studio. So there's a radio station called LBC here that uh, occasionally has the London Mayor uh, going in and uh, doing, um, and doing a, a, a call-in show. 
and little bits of that get taken out and reused elsewhere and get released to the TV news who then who then use that uh, uh, on the air and similarly there's another radio station run by by the BBC Five Live which is a news uh, a news uh, station and again sometimes really good things happen on that station which again they can then share with their TV colleagues uh, and with other people mm. as well and one of the one of the most popular uh, clips <clears throat> of that actually is um, is a mouse going into the studio and the and the presenter who who was on the air literally jumping on her chair because uh, she was so terrified of the mouse but you know um, it made for fantastic radio it made for even better video that you could actually go and share with other people so that, that was really interesting scene um, so we've been talking, and by the way, if you just tuned in, we're talking to James Cridland, uh, who is a radio futurologist in, in London. He speaks at quite a few conventions uh, in the radio and, and, and similar industries. And I'm just I'm eager to know uh, about his optimism about the radio industry and where it's going. And so uh, uh, I lamented a bit that I felt like content on a lot of radio, at least where I live, is not as interesting as I would have, or maybe my interests have changed. I don't know. Maybe it's a, maybe radio is as good as it used to be, and in some ways uh, better. Um, but uh, it, it doesn't always suit my needs. But some interactivity uh, is always helpful. I, I love, um, for example, uh, seeing album art or understanding who an artist is. That I'd, I've heard this song before, but I don't know what it is. And that's where we're going we're to start moving into this area of talking about the technology that can bring some flair, some sizzle, and, and some uh, shininess uh, back to the radio experience. Hey, I understand uh, Chris Tobin has uh, joined us in studio. Chris, are you with us? I'm here. Hey, glad hey, to see you. Oh, glad to Did, see you both. Sorry didn't for, realize the, for the tardiness. Oh, that's fine. I didn't realize till a few minutes ago that you were actually heading toward the GFQ studios in New York. Yes, I had an LT enabled phone in the car with the camera and uh, my earpiece and ready to go if you guys wanted to come to me on while I was on the interstate. So uh, it would have been fun. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that would've, well, that would have been entertaining, well, wouldn't it? We'll save that for another time, like when you get pulled over or something. <laughs> oh no, it's hands free. You know, I had it propped up on the the, the, the dash. <laughs> so, so Chris, you're up on on James Cridland. You may have you've even uh, heard of James before or seen him uh, speak at at a conference. Yes, at several, and I've watched several videos. Uh, I love, oh, I enjoy really very You'll, much his uh, his take on on broadcasting you will, media. And you will never get that time back. This is true. <laughs> <laughs> time worth worth. But you know, it's a timey wimey thing, so I, I can always figure out a way to get the time back. <laughs> <laughs> so we were we were just about to move the conversation into the technology part, which of course yeah, I love. I just eat this stuff up, and so do our, our our viewers and listeners on this week in radio tech. We like to think. I mean, we all know that content is king, but we also like to think that there are things we can do technologically to enhance uh, a, a listener's experience, to hold them on longer, to to invite them in better. Uh, uh, and and so we're going to move the conversation in that direction, talking about these technologies, including radio DNS, which is something that I still don't think I have my brain wrapped around, maybe because I haven't seen it or played with it yet. There's a terrific video on, on YouTube that uh, uh, James uh, uh, sent me to. We'll put the uh, information in the show notes. It's a, a demonstration of radio DNS on the Galaxy Express 2 LTE. So that's a smartphone, obviously. Uh, we'll put that in the show notes. Don't don't go watch it now. We'll, we'll you know you can watch it after the show. And uh, uh, but let's let's have James. James, can you just okay give us the executive summary of Radio DNS, and then probably after the commercial break, I'd like you to take us through step by step what a an engineer or what a radio station does to enable Radio DNS. What's the executive mm -hmm. summary here? Well, Radio DNS is hybrid radio. So just to, in the same way as you have a uh, Toyota Prius that uses uh, electricity sometimes and gas at other times, uh, and you get to where you want to go and it works absolutely fine, uh, so hybrid radio is using both the internet and broadcast radio to make a better user experience. So broadcast radio is brilliant, as we all know. It's a really good, really cheap way to broadcast to hundreds of thousands of people. And also, on the other side, it's a really good, really cheap way to pick up um, a great range of stations. You know, so um, it uses much less battery power. It uses much less uh, data connection on your data plan. Um, mm -hmm. So broadcast radio is a great thing. But what broadcast radio do doesn't have is any of the additional stuff that you expect from a great user experience these days. So um, it doesn't have any now playing information. It's got some, it's got some um, not, not very good, I nearly saw there, not very good uh, RDS information. Um, mm -hmm. and then, if you sit there long enough, it'll scroll around. Um, but with the exception of that, it has virtually nothing there. So you still have to tune in using a frequency 
frequency. You still uh, you have no uh, images that go with uh, what you have. You have nothing clever for your radio to do clever stuff with. Um, and so what Radio DNS Hybrid Radio is there to end up doing is to help your radio, which is tuned into your FM signal or your HD signal or your uh, DAB signal, it helps your, uh, your radio also find more information about that radio station on the internet and help make radio better. Now, what if There's I'm what if I'm streaming? Song. What if I'm streaming on my on my phone? Can I get some radio DNS activity with 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 streaming? Yeah, so I mean, radio DNS is there to make broadcast radio better, but also mm -hmm. what uh, some of the applications that radio DNS has, um, which is adding visuals or or indeed helping your your phone know where else this particular radio station is available, is just as applicable to uh, internet radio as well. Um, so uh, visuals is is an obvious one, but say I'm in uh, New York, say I'm listening to. WPLJ, there's a great big FM transmitter there. That works fantastically. But mm -hmm. then say if I walk into uh, one of the shopping malls and the FM signal goes, well, what my radio should be able to to do automatically is go, I can't get the FM signal anymore, but I know where else I can find this, this <sighs> radio station. I'll flick over onto the internet. And that's another thing that Radio DNS does. Really simple, really straightforward. Great if you're driving, by the way. Really, mm -hmm. really good if you're driving. Um, and, enables you to, uh, and enables you to keep tuned in to that radio station. And by the way, flick back onto FM as soon as you can get the FM signal again so that WPLJ doesn't have to pay any of the music rights. So it's a really simple and straightforward thing. That sounds brilliant. I'll, you know, when I was first introduced to RDS, I was uh, doing some work in France and I saw, you know, Blaupunkt receiver that has two radios in it and it would automatically keep us connected to any of the various low power transmitters that were all transmitting the same audio for this uh, radio network in mm. France that I was working at. And I thought that brilliant. Now it's different than the US model where we have, you know, one big honking high power transmitter that covers a large area and France, we had a lot of you know kilowatt or smaller transmitters. Mm. Um, so, it's, but still, that sounds brilliant. Going from a broadcast environment into a streaming environment, back and forth automatically. Boy, the, uh, I I can imagine a lot of difficulty with that. But I can also imagine if it does work, if we can make it work, um, then uh, if we can somehow line up the audio at least a little bit, then that could be pretty smart. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to. Yeah, say. and of course, and you've and you've always got that, but that that particular issue. But if if for example you were a radio station, your your and your primary FM is in one place and you're also carried on an HD2 channel somewhere else, it could automatically follow that way as well. Uh, it, could auto, it could automatically follow uh, onto other platforms if you wanted to as well. So that's really neat. And again, it comes back to making the user experience of a radio station better, um, not just dumping people with a frequency and a black screen and saying, that's it, that's the only user experience you actually have. Now you have now playing information, you have ways to interact with the studio, you have ways to uh, buy stuff if you want, um, but also ways to keep that signal with you uh, however you want to end up um, tuning into the radio station or indeed ducking out and having a listen to a podcast if you want to hear more. Gotcha. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So how uh, is, is Radio DNS, is this uh, technology uh, taking off in, in the UK? Um, it, what, what's really interesting is it's taking off um, right around the world. So we're actually mm -hmm. seeing um, the uh, German public broadcasters this um, uh, last week were talking about how they're producing uh, additional visual information and additional um, and additional the uh, EPG stuff, the stuff that helps you uh, move from FM over onto DAB, over onto onto the internet. So the German public service broadcasters are doing it, the Dutch uh, public service broadcasters are doing it, um, lots of radio stations in the UK. Um, there are already some radio stations in the US doing it, um, and um, there'll be uh, demos doubtless in uh, Vegas in the, at the NAB show, which by the way I am also speaking at, so um, you know, so do come along and 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 uh, see me there. Um, and there are radio stations in Canada and in and in Australia doing it. So it's it's taking off quite well. Where where Radio DNS has uh, suffered is that it's only been available on a couple of receivers so far. Mm -hmm. So you know, and those receivers typically have been high end receivers. They've been uh, you know DAB plus internet plus everything else receivers, and and they're lovely, but they're not how most people tune into the radio. Now we're mm -hmm. actually seeing. Um, mobile phone manufacturers putting it in 
as standard uh, into their mobile phones, which is which is really good. And also, uh, car manufacturers really taking it seriously now and really mm. working out there are, there, are, there are really clear safety benefits in making sure that you're not forever flicking around on your on your radio trying to keep with the ball game or trying to keep with whatever it is that you're having a listen to. If the radio can automatically keep that signal for you, no matter how it's getting that signal, then it's great news for for people who are who are uh, driving. So it's really interesting now. You're b- beginning to see real take up of um, of radio DNS from a receiver um, uh, um, standpoint, as well as from a broadcaster's one. Wow. So uh, Chris Tobin is in the, the mega city of New York where maybe there's some radio DNS activity going on there. Chris, tell, tell us about your interaction with radio DNS. And, and uh, I, I, I have no experience with this, just still curious about how it works and we're going to get to in the second half of our show. Mr. Tobin, what are, what are your thoughts at this point? Um, I have not had too much experience with radio DNS, though I've read about it and I've talked to folks who have uh, said they've tried it out. Here in the, the Big Apple, New York City, um, I don't think everybody's really jumped on the board with a hybrid uh, radio approach, radio DNS office, which I thought was pretty cool technology. Uh, the big thing here in town is the iHeart radio platform with the clear channel stations, radio.com with CBS, and then Cumulus, I think, promotes uh, iHeart radio. So that's, what you, that's all you hear and see. Um, broadcasters in New York City, I think, are still way behind the curve and are not paying attention, despite the fact that content might be king. Uh, they, they insist on producing content that just shoves people away. So, so many broadcasters, uh, including my little stuff, a few of my stations, uh, you know, we, we have our over-the-air signal and we have a streaming uh, stream a- as well, but we don't have any way to connect the two or to let you choose which one easily. You're using one, you're using the other. And if you're using the one, if you're using the analog signal, of course, there's almost no data that goes along with that. One of our, two of our stations have, have RDS, but there's precious little uh, going on there. Um, in, the, in the examples of, of radio DNS that are given, uh, James, you mentioned uh, higher-end uh, receivers. And I think we've seen, is there one that looks like an egg? It's got a flat yeah, front, there's a color one, screen? Yeah, there's one that looks like a... A rugby ball. Um, ah, okay, I, used to have, I used to have one of those, and the TSA broke it. So, oh no! <laughs> so I don't. So I don't have one anymore. <laughs> but the example that's that's given so often now is that of a uh, of a smartphone and uh, the an FM receiver in there. Now you know in the U.S., uh, uh, Jeff Jeff Smulian and Emmis they've uh, been working to uh, get FM receivers turned on in smartphones, even though many of them already have it in there. Um, yeah. And I've never gotten to play with this myself. But you go to India. And this is how everybody listens to the radio is with their with their their feature phone typically, and it may not even be a smartphone. It's a, a feature phone with an FM receiver in it. Um, just but before the break here, tell us culturally why does that work out in India and maybe there are other countries where your phone is the first or you know your current FM radio, whereas in the U.S. I would it just doesn't occur to me to use my phone as an FM radio. I guess mostly because it it can't right now, but. Um, what, what's this cultural difference, and and how do we how do we get uh, the radio the the phone which everybody has with them now to to be the radio? Well, so you mentioned iHeartRadio, which is a great um, uh, you know it's a really great user experience. But again, if you're sitting there in um, uh, in uh, New York, for example, you're listening to a local uh, a local radio station on iHeart, and you're actually using a bunch of bandwidth that you don't need to use because it's all already available on uh, on uh, FM. Uh, you're costing the radio station money because they're having to pay for additional music licenses um, for all of the um, for all of the usage of uh, music uh, on the internet. Um, and uh, and it's using your your bandwidth and it's using battery life and everything else. So actually, in terms of making iHeartRadio, for example, better, if iHeartRadio knows that you can also get the radio station that you're listening to over FM, then mm-hmm. great. You don't even need to know as a as a user that that the that the app is automatically switched you over onto onto FM because it can get the FM uh, signal. Um, but that way, you're saving yourself seven times the amount of battery life. You're saving mm-hmm. yourself um, incredible amounts of bandwidth. You know, incredible amounts of uh, of uh, and you're saving uh, uh, broadcasters uh, all of that money that that uh, is uh, spent to the music collection agencies as well. So it's a win-win-win. You know, you can't you can't have anything you know worse th- than you know something that works for for everybody. I think what's interesting when you start having a look at places like uh, India. Um, is that uh, you know clearly everybody uh, has a mobile phone in India, 
and uh, the FM chip is turned on in India primarily because um, uh, radio, as you know, in India has really kicked off uh, recently. Lots more commercial uh, radio stations have um, have uh, started uh, broadcasting, and the mobile phone networks haven't seen FM as a threat. The mobile phone networks have seen FM as being a reason to go and buy a phone. Mm -hmm. um, because mm -hmm. so many people enjoy that. If you compare that with the US, particularly the US actually, FM is seen as a way of getting entertainment into a device um, that, the, that the mobile networks don't control and that the mobile networks can't earn any money from. Um, and that's the big the big difference. Um, so in places like India, it's seen as a consumer benefit. In places like uh, the US, it's seen as something which actually takes control away from the, the likes of AT&T uh, and those types of, um, of, of uh, organizations. So it's, it's probably more a um, commercial conversation than it is a cultural one. Um, but, you know, we know if you look at the the next radio app, for example, um, that uh, we, we're, we're already seeing is doing great guns in terms of the amount of time spent listening uh, to mm. it is um, is uh, significantly higher, it seems, than uh, than than uh, streaming apps. Primarily because you know, again, it's using seven times less battery. You know, so if you could if you can do that with a great hybrid experience, as the, the next radio app is. And you can actually get a really good user experience um, for the listener, and that's and that's the really important part here. You, you point out something that I really hadn't realized until you pointed it out, and that is that one of the most expensive things you can do in terms of uh, of limited bandwidth, uh, in terms of licensing costs and just and, and and infrastructure costs, and in terms of just your own battery life, is streaming data. Uh, that that takes that that's the hardest thing for a cell phone to do and an fm battery uh, an, an fm receiver uh, chipset uh, uh, as you mentioned uses seven times mm. less power it can be much more efficient than all the handshaking and yada 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 that goes on between yeah, the cell and phone also of course and, a, and also of course there's a big difference between the way that pandora works and the way that um and the way that a live stream works what pandora is doing in the background is it's downloading the next song and it doesn't matter yeah. if you go into a into a dead area and then back out of the dead area your your pandora will will be playing the song which it's already cached and, yeah. and downloading a few more so it's a really nice user experience again once you start having a look at trying to stream live data um, for a live radio program, you know, you'll know that actually that gets really quite difficult. Either you have um, dead spots or you have spots where there's so much cell phone activity that mm -hmm. the amount of bandwidth that you get is very, very low. So again, you know, FM radio really, really helps in that regard. And you've got the emergency stuff and you've got, you know, all, all manner of the other um, uh, important things that broadcast radio can do that uh, that that, that uh, internet can't, but internet radio works. F uh, uh, but internet works fantastically alongside broadcast r r radio, which is where radio DNS comes in. You know, you, you it, it, I've always thought it's kind of interesting the different cell phone companies' uh, attitudes toward using their data. It seems at different times in technology, cell phone companies have have not wanted you to use too much data. They charge a lot for it. Uh, discouraging its use, or they want you to use a lot of, of data. And one thing I noticed that T-Mobile, and I'm, I'm a T-Mobile customer in the U.S., that they were uh, the first to do everything they could to encourage you to not use their data by using Wi-Fi. So you could, they were, yeah. I guess they were the first to let you make phone calls over Wi-Fi. I'm in a basement office here. I do have a window out the back, but my cell phone signal is a little weak right here, even though the tower is not far away. But I've got strong Wi-Fi, and I can do anything over the phone on Wi-Fi that I could uh, could do uh, with the cell mm -hmm. phone signal. And, and T-Mobile has been, you know, it re reduces the load of them to have to build out their, their network. Dovetails nicely with the whole radio DNS idea that you're receiving the broadcast the way, I guess you could say, you should be in a, in a mass <laughs> distribution manner, and then picking up little extra bits of, of data about that, the metadata. Yeah, 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 exactly right. And I think, you know, it, it is interesting once you start having a look at what some of the mobile networks are doing in terms of trying to offload as much data onto Wi-Fi as possible. Well, that's fine, but you then start walking down uh, a typical uh, high street. Mm -hmm. and, what, and, what's, and what's happening on your phone uh, now, because um, BT does much the same uh, here in the UK, is that your phone is constantly connecting to the cell phone network, 
And then when it sees a BT signal, it will try connecting to that, and it takes time to connect and everything else. And then when it sees another, um, another BT signal, it will try and switch over onto that. Now, that's actually fine from the point of view of using a phone as you would normally use it, um, because you don't need that consistent connection. Um, in terms of bandwidth. As long as you have um, bandwidth 50, 60 percent of the time, you'll still get your email, you'll still be able to tweet, you'll still be able to get you know, your Facebook messages and everything else. But of course for streaming uh, audio, you need a consistent stream of data and you need that to be always there and always available. So offloading stuff onto, onto Wi-Fi is normally a great idea, but it really hurts streaming radio. <laughs> Yeah, hear you. Hey, you're uh, watching or listening to This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack. Our guest is James Cridland, a radio futurologist. In the second half of our show, we're going to talk some tech specifics of how to implement uh, an infrastructure in your broadcast plant to support radio DNS. And I'm really interested in hearing this. I want to understand this. Chris Tobin is in studio at the GFQ Network. Hey, Chris, are you there? I'm here. I'm enjoying it. All right, good. I'm enjoying it. Hey, Chris, things. we're going to do a commercial here for uh, the Telos Pro Stream. And so everybody listen in. I want to, I want to tell you about it. The, our show is brought to you by my employer and our friends at, at Telos. The Pro Stream is an internet uh, encoding appliance. It's not a PC. Uh, you don't have to keep the operating system updated like you would with uh, Windows. You know, I, I one thing that we we, we – kind of understand that Telos and our sister company, Omnia, is that some folks, you know, w w which is better for streaming, PC and software or an appliance? And the answer is up to you. It's, it's totally your comfort level. Me, I'm a little tired of updating Windows PCs all the time. I'm a little tired of the reboots in the middle of the night. And I, I know you can set them not to do that, but I, say, I seem to forget to. I'm a little tired of all that. And I'm a little tired of, of you know, uh, a fan clogging up with, um, with dust. Of course, that's my fault for not cleaning it. I get that. Uh, but there's some advantages to an appliance, a box that you just plug in. Uh, yes, there are software updates available for new features if you need them. But otherwise, you just set it up and you leave it alone. And that's what the Telos ProStream does. Now, the ProStream is a one-rack unit high box. Let's see. Can you see here? Let me turn my, let me turn that a little bit. There we go. It's this box right here. I'll brighten up the display a little bit. It has on the back audio inputs, analog, left and right, uh, XLR inputs. It also has uh, a live wire jack on it, so you can feed it from your live wire network if you happen to have that in your facility. Coming out in a few months, we will have the AES version as well, so analog AES or live wire. Uh, it will cost a little bit more money, so for now, you want to get this one that's analog or live wire. And inside is, first of all, an Omnia audio processor. And it's not just, you know, we didn't just take the FM Omnia code and port it into this. No. Uh, we really studied what you have to do to properly process audio that's going to be going into an encoder, a bit rate reduction encoder, like MP3 or one of the AAC family encoders. And we determined some things about this years ago. We keep improving on that tech, but inside the ProStream is a three-band Omnia audio encoder. It's pretty gentle, but you can crank it up, but the presets are fairly gentle. And then it's got a very sophisticated look-ahead limiter, so it doesn't do any clipping to your audio. You could easily set the audio bandwidth uh, to, you know, uh, set it appropriately for your bit rate that you're going to encode to. And after the uh, Omnia audio encoding, uh, after the Omnia processing, there are two encoders. Now, this is starting with version 2.0 of the software, so if you're still on a 1.0 software, upgrade to something newer. Two encoders in there, and these can be completely different. One can be AAC at maybe a low bit rate. We have HE AAC V2, for example. You can run that at 56 kilobits per second, and it sounds quite nice. Uh, then you can uh, continue to make a stream at uh, an MP3 stream, for example, at 96 or 128 kilobits per second. And then you can take these two streams that you've encoded at whichever uh, bit rate and whichever uh, algorithm you want to, and we have an output matrix of four outputs. So these four outputs, you can send these streams to maybe geographically divergent uh, servers around the world. Maybe you want to send a stream over to Europe to a stream uh, server there, maybe a Shoutcast server there. Or maybe you want to send one to Australia or just have a, a couple in the U.S., one main, one backup. So there's different ways you can get that done. Now, here's the cool part. We're talking about metadata on the show. The ProStream has this very cool metadata ingest system. It's, it's done using the Lua scripting language, 
And there are already a bunch of uh, filters already in there for you that may already fit your automation system. If you have an automation system or a need that the built-in filters don't quite fit, then you can uh, run a little program we provide you, grab the data from your automation system, send the output to us, and we'll build you a filter that uh, grabs you know, the title and the artist and uh, commercial sponsor information, whatever you want, uh, and puts it into the metadata uh, system that, uh, th that is probably as part of streaming. So check it out on the web. If you go to telos-systems.com, look for ProStream and uh, check it out there. We're shipping a bunch of these every month. People are using them all over the world. Uh, I like it because it's reliable. I haven't had to reboot it. It just sits there and runs and puts out streams. By the way, I it is compatible one with... Of the, one of yeah, the really yeah. interesting things about this is that you because you're actually processing your audio separately for online, that's exactly the right way of doing it. And the amount of radio yeah. stations that I've worked with who have taken their... Uh, FM uh, audio and try to then um, use that uh, for their for their online audio. It really does not sound as good as properly processing audio for online. So it's really good to uh, to uh, see that the Omnia Audio stuff is is already in this box as well. Frank Foti did a great white paper on on this very subject, and uh, the the white paper kind of goes along the lines of, you know, we understand audio processing for AM, and we understand it for FM, and these are really uh, flat mathematical functions. They don't change. We know what goes in. We know what comes out. Uh, to get the most out of it, it's a flat, two-dimensional mathematical function. But streaming, stream encoders, change their behavior based on the audio coming into them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and maybe an older one like MPEG Layer 2 doesn't so much, but newer ones do. And so we'd like to kind of understand what the encoder is likely to do with the audio so that we can make the encoding process easier, you know, get more efficiency from the encoder, not give it things that are difficult to encode if we can do that without hurting the audio. So that's a lot of the philosophy that goes into uh, uh, Omnia processing for, uh, for encoding. You wouldn't use your AM processor on your FM station especially with the NRSC curve on it, it just oh, it wouldn't sound right at all. Uh, and the 10 kilohertz brick wall filter. So don't use your, your you know, transmission processor for, uh, for your stream. All right, uh, so we're here with uh, uh, James Cridland on uh, This Week in Radio Tech, number 201. And uh, James, uh, for, for me and for Chris Tobin, please uh, walk us through. I own some radio stations. We've got automation systems. We've got a little bit of RDS here and there. Good internet connections at our stations. Um, what do we need to 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 do to grab the data that needs to be grabbed and uh, make it available to Radio DNS? Several step process. Okay, yeah, and it's a and it's a three step um, uh, thing. The first thing that you have to do is to um, do the magic, and the magic is connecting uh, your radio station, your radio station's uh, broadcasts. Um, with something that then helps uh, the app find more information over the internet. That's oh. what Radio DNS is. So that's the glue that links your FM broadcast, in this case, to, uh, to uh, your web servers. Um, you have to... Now, it's, it's deeply, deeply techy, but the way that it works is it uses information that's already in your FM RDS uh, uh, signal, Mm -hmm. um, it uses that alongside your frequency and alongside the country that you're in and various other things to essentially make a domain name. And that domain name's hidden away in the system, but that domain name then points to your servers. So it's a really simple, straightforward mechanism. Um, it works in exactly the same way as DNS works uh, across the, the rest of the web. So it's um, highly reliable, uh, works fantastically well. Um, and that's why Radio DNS is called Radio DNS. It really is a oh, so lookup table in between. Oh, see, so the, the uh, DNS broadcast. does come from domain name server? That, that, that's where yeah, the same yeah, idea absolutely. comes from? Okay. Absolutely, and that and that's exactly what what is going on under under the hood. So what so what um, uh, so what any of these apps are doing is that they're looking at your FM signal, um, and they're going to the equivalent of um, of a, a domain name which has your frequency in it and your RDSPI code and your uh, country code and various mm -hmm. other things that you're already broadcasting. Um, has a look, sees if that exists. If that exists, yay, you are Radio DNS enabled and the app can then go and find out f directly from your servers um, mm. What kind of things you support? Do you support visuals? Do you support radio EPG, which is the the, the mechanism of handing you off from FM 
um, onto the internet, and by the way, uh, 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 an awful lot more as well. Um, mm. So that little bit, setting yourself up in terms of Radio DNS, it's free, um, and you need to go on to the Radio DNS website uh, in in order to end up uh, doing that. Uh, and the address is really simple: it's radiodns.org, radiodns.org. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, you should probably sit there with your engineer who understands RDS and your um, and your IT guy who understands how C names work and and uh, and that kind of thing in terms of DNS um, to understand exactly what you have to do. But it's simple and and it's relatively straightforward if you understand it. This so uh, this, let me interrupt for a second. For, if I understand it correctly, for if I'm already doing RDS on my FM, yep. so I'm doing. I'm grabbing title and artist information and maybe commercial sponsor information and maybe uh, program, if, if I've got a morning show and you know I have what? a, a, a you don't, name. You don't even need to do any of that. So you don't oh. even need to do any of the clever um, uh, automatically updated stuff in terms of RDS. The only RDS information it uses is the PI code. And the PI code um, is a little piece of data which is always there in your RDS. Mm-hmm. Um, nobody sees it. But it's hidden yeah. away in your in your broadcast uh, in your broadcast information. In the U.S., it's made uh, in the U.S. It's made up of uh, an algorithm based on your call letters. In the in the U.K., we're told what PI code that we have to broadcast by our regulator. Um, but yeah, so it's it's just that. So you don't even need to have clever RDS. Um, if it's just pumping out a station name, great. That's all you actually need. Well, my, you know, I just found that an RDS PI code generator or calculator on the web. Uh, so I entered the call sign of one of my stations, and bam, it gives me back a decimal and a hex PI code. So this would go in my That's RDS the- generator. Oh, hopefully, it's already there. Uh, if if yeah, I missed should, that part, it should I need be to put already it in. there. Otherwise, the FCC will be very upset with you. Okay, but uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it it should be there automatically. And and literally all that Radio DNS uses is it uses that alongside your. Uh, broadcast frequency, which your radio already knows, alongside your uh, the country that you're in, which your radio probably already knows, and you're actually broadcasting that information over RDS anyway. Um, it uses that to literally find out um, to literally find out from that information, which is relatively unique, to find out okay, w- w- um, does this radio station is this radio station in r- Radio DNS? Is there more information I can find out? Mm-hmm. Really easy and straightforward. Now, if I'm not in Radio DNS, you mentioned a registration process earlier. Yeah, so you literally you go onto the Radio DNS w- website um, mm. and you can uh, drop the uh, the project team an email there. Um, it's free right now. Um, eventually, there will be a charge. Um, it says on the Radio DNS website um, that the charge will be ten pounds a station. So, it, uh, sorry, ten US dollars a station. Uh, in yeah. fact, so it's even it's even uh, it's even less in terms of pounds. So, um, so yeah, so it's not it's not going to be huge. It's it's just essentially another domain name um, but it's a long a, a long complicated one that only your rds your radio dns receiver will actually cope with gotcha. so really simple and really simple and straightforward and free so you can go ahead and do that and mm-hmm. once you've done that then the uh, any radio dns capable receiver will know where you are on the internet as soon as they tune into one of your FM stations. And this works with HD, it works with DAB+, uh, it works with DRM if you're broadcasting that somewhere in the world like India. Um, it works with all of these uh, s- s- services as well. Um, once, you've, uh, once your radio is now, um, is now looking at your web server to find out what other things you support, that's okay. where that's this next part. Okay, so um, I got this clear now. The, the, I've, mm-hmm. I got my smartphone. I'm, I'm the FM tuner is tuned into a radio station. I'm mm-hmm. getting a PI code from there, so the the application knows exactly what station I'm listening to. Now yeah. it go it, it knows how to make that URL and goes out to that URL to the server that I control, and it's going to yeah. grab some additional information from that, right? Exactly right. Exactly right. Okay. So you're in, you're in control of absolutely everything from that point uh, forward. So you've got a simple, straightforward mechanism of telling Radio DNS uh, where your wh- what what your broadcast is and where you are on the internet. And once you've done that, uh, it's only a one. It's it's a once only thing, uh, and then that's then that's then done. Um, mm-hmm. 
And you need to, if you're going to support the new stuff, which is in all of these new um, Samsung phones, and there are quite a few uh, available throughout uh, Europe and Asia right now, and of course, it'll come, it'll be a global thing uh, f fairly soon because, you know, Samsung clearly want to make sure that the apps in their phones are as global as possible, you know, so I'm sure that we'll see that in North America as well. Mm -hmm. um, what they're supporting is they're supporting two things. They're supporting something called Radio Viz and something called Radio EPG. Now, Radio Viz is the, is the pretty uh, images um, that you see when you're, when you're uh, tuned in. So um, this is a, 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 a smartphone. Um, this will uh, really work on, your, on the MP3 version of this podcast, won't it? But this is a, but this is a smartphone that's running um, a, little, a little test here. It's tuned into Capital FM uh, here in the UK, and you can see there's some really nice, uh, really nice images um, uh, on the screen. You, you just saw um, one, of the, uh, one of the songs that was playing, and now this is a guy called Marvin, apparently, who's their, mm. who's their evening show jock. Um, ah. There you go. There's a there's Very fashionable a, dresser there, a, Marvin is. Yes, indeed. Indeed. How fantastic. Um, <laughs> and there's a little piece of, of uh, text underneath, which you won't be able to, to, um, yeah. to uh, see on my, on my poor, uh, camera. Um, so that's what Radio Viz is all about. And um, there are um, a number of different ways of producing those images and that text. Um, you can do it yourself. And there's a bunch of uh, code and uh, software uh, out there to end up doing it. It uses a protocol called Stomp or called Comet. Um, but there's um, simple, straightforward code that you, can, that you can download and install. Or, of course, you can pay somebody to, um, to produce that uh, for you. And there's a bunch of companies um, uh, on the Radio DNS uh, w website that can actually help with that. And it could well be mm. that your uh, playout system is already outputting you know, enough information to be able to produce um, these, uh, the, these uh, images in a really n nice way. And by the way, um, the, reason, uh, the, the reason why it's images as well as, as well as text is that you can put stuff in your images um, that uh, you, know, you can put a bunch of really interesting things like uh, pack shots, um, like station logos, like advertiser mm -hmm. logos, um, <clears throat> you know, all that kind of stuff, as well as, as well as things that will actually take some of the clutter off the air. So, uh, uh, traffic and travel, um, uh, whether the uh, whether the um, the subway's working, you know, all of that kind of information you can actually add uh, uh, onto the screen there, and that's one of the things that um, quite a few of the radio stations here in the UK are doing. Um, so that you've actually got additional. Uh, additional opportunities to actually see some really interesting um, uh, information while you're getting the kids ready for uh, for a school, or while you're um, or while you're doing doing uh, other things while you're tuned uh, into the radio. Help me under one thing I, I may have missed here. So help me understand this. So I'm running the app, and a new mm -hmm. song starts, and I take it that at the same time or with or very shortly thereafter, I could have. Uh, album art, or I could have a picture of the artist, or or some such something to do with the artist on my screen. Um, where does the timing of that take place? How does the app know that I've switched songs? And then where does the art come from? And do I have to assemble all that myself, or can I hire a company that's already put the album art together for me? Yeah, so you can, well, um, so in, t in terms of who does it, um, either you can do that yourself or you can hire someone. Um, so there's a radio station here, um, Absolute Radio, uh, when it was called Virgin Radio, I worked there, and they've got a very clever uh, techie uh, team, and um, they made their system to make uh, album art and stuff in an afternoon. Um, so it was relatively fast for them. I'm not saying that everybody's going to be as fast as they are, um, mm. but you know, so so you can you can build that yourself, and of course you can you can also find um, find uh, organisations that can do that uh, for you. And, the, and there's a bunch of a bunch of uh, companies on the, on the website. The technical way that it works in terms of timing is quite is quite interesting. So it does two things. Um, firstly, what it's doing is your app is connecting almost to kind of a chat server. Mm. Um, and and so it's watching what uh, that particular uh, chat server is doing, and that chat server says, "I'm playing a new song. Show this image now." Ah, and it will go off and show the image. It's so pretty that, that, dumb. That ch is, is that chat server code that's running on a station's uh, a, a server controlled by the station or some third party? Yeah, um, but it, it can be either. It can be either. Okay. So um, uh, and and that uses it uses Stomp, which is a pretty standard pr protocol to do ah. this kind of thing. And I and I will be I will be laughed at for calling it a chat server, but that's but that's essentially how it, yeah, how, yeah. how it works. It works so in my head. Thank saying, you. <laughs> 
So, so what it's actually saying is, show this image now. That's all it's actually saying. Show this image now. Show this image now. Show this mm -hmm. image now. That's all, mm -hmm. it, that's, that's all it's actually doing. So pretty simple and, and, um, and uh, straightforward. But what you can also do is you can, is you can say, show this image when it's this time. So you can actually program ahead if you want to, um, yeah. as well as just rely on on the internet being fast enough to actually switch, you know, automatically. So if you went to, once you go into an ad break, for example, uh, uh, into a stop set, you can actually potentially program all of the images to go alongside the ads, so that you know uh, that they're going to change instantly, rather than having to wait for that particular image to download. So you can do some quite clever things in terms of the of the timing, and that was important to quite a few broadcasters that just wanted to make sure that they weren't just going to um, rely on the speed of the internet to show an image. Um, you know, they 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 reckoned that that was a a better way of actually pre scheduling um, pre scheduling uh, uh, images. And by the so way, this is this is this is pretty close to. Um, slideshow, which DAB and DAB Plus uses, um, and it's not too far away from um, from the uh, from the RCS um, uh, live artist experience, as well as the experience from um, from HD radio as well. So actually, mm. you know, all of these do fit together quite nicely. Wow! So you got my head. Back. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go. <laughs> well, I was going to say, it, it, so you've got Radio Viz, which is the images. Yeah. Um, and that's and that's really nice and really straightforward. The the one that's even more straightforward actually is the other one, which is which is Radio EPG. What Radio mm. EPG is is it's uh, is it's um, an XML document that contains information about your radio station. Now um, the Samsung apps use that to find out where you're broadcasting on the internet. So if I've tuned in over the FM, um, where else is this radio station available? And it will uh, link to uh, the streams and the stream types and all of that. And it even has a an inbuilt uh, cost, if you like. So if you want most people to switch over to an HD2 channel instead of the internet because the internet costs you more, then uh -huh. you can do that. You can actually program in into your XML. I'd really prefer you to use these, um, these uh, platforms in this order. Ah, um, okay. Which is, which, is, which is actually really nice because there are certain broadcasters, maybe ones who are using quite intelligent ad insertion that maybe don't want you even tuning into the FM at all and would much rather that you were tuned in over, over the internet because they get more cost per thousand in terms of the ad insertion. So you can actually yeah. do some quite, quite clever um, uh, business rules you know, in terms of that. Um, but, what the X, but what the XML also includes is things like what your radio station is called, uh, logos, um, a program schedule if you want to fill that in, um, all of this kind of information. And again, it's really, really close to the, the specification for DAB, for DRM, for HD radio as well in terms of the specification of what you're actually sticking in there. So it really isn't a whole lot of extra uh, uh, of extra work in there um, and again that goes on your website and you're in control of that and you can change that whenever you like um, and what's really nice is that we know that other organizations are using um, that format to keep their lists up to date so you know some of the large uh, aggregators uh, are using um, the Radio EPG uh, XML file to go, ah, where, where do I get a decent logo for this station? You know, where do I get um, uh, information about what's, what, what's, uh, what, what shows on now and all that kind of stuff? So again, it's relatively easy and, e easy and, uh, and uh, straightforward. And there's um, documentation on the Radio DNS uh, w website. It could probably be even easier still if somebody wanted to write a, a, um, an XML generator um, so that you just had a really simple form t to, um, to, to, to uh, fill out. And the wonders of an open project such as Radio DNS should hopefully mean that um, somebody will um, b build that and make that available to us. I would, I would look forward to that. I would be scared to death to edit an XML document myself, not knowing the, all the, the, you know, the right syntaxes to put in. But if I could fill out a form and have it, bam, do it mm. for me, that'd be, that'd be very cool. Yeah, and I take yeah. it that there are commercial uh, services, or, or there certainly should be people who will take care of that for you if you don't want to go through that 
Yeah, shop. yeah, absolutely. So, there's, so, and again, you know, so, there's, so there's a bunch of of people who can do that, and it may well be that um, the 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 company that runs your website um, is already uh, able to it to export information in that in that form as well. And if not, you should probably tell them to, because actually, you know, if if you imagine this technology in millions of people's pockets right around the world you know that that's mm. a pretty that, that's a pretty important thing and you know people who make radio station sites um are already supporting other uh other content outputs and radio dns uh, stuff is just y- yet another content output um you know exactly like that but radio I've dns a- also gives you the local aspect of radio yeah that's yeah that's exactly part, that's a part I, what i'm finding fa- amazing is that radio dns has not picked up any traction here in the states as it should because if anything, content being king, content being king for the local uh, listener will will say, Radio DNS actually puts you in their pocket, as you pointed out, and by marrying or uh, merging the, the the cell phone or the mobile phone technology with the local traditional legacy FM broadcast, you have now a captive audience you can add more and do more with, and in the end, the advertiser could actually benefit more than just a simple, you know, aggregating no, service or ad it, server. On a website. Yeah, and you are, and you are, and you are absolutely right. And I think one of the one of the really uh, cool things is that the next radio app, which is a which is a really clever example of hybrid radio, that is actually getting uh, FM chips um, switched on in mobile phones in the U.S. Um, if your radio station isn't signed up to Tag Station, um, which you have to to do for all of the uh, functions in the next radio app. Um, then even if your radio station isn't signed up to Tag Station, um, the next radio app will still use Radio DNS under the hood to give you visuals when you end up tuning in. So ah. actually, it's already there in the US. If you use the next radio app, um, that will automatically grab some of the information. You'll, you'll get a better experience if you sign up with, with, uh, with a Tag uh, Station, of course. But the fact is, it will, still, it will still at least give you a better user experience than just a number on a screen um, because to come back to our earlier conversation that's what this is all about this is all about getting a better user experience for broadcast radio to make sure that you get a streaming radio app like experience but for broadcast radio as well this is fascinating uh, uh, unfortunately we're about out of time uh, Chris Tobin do you have any wrap up questions here before we ask uh, James to Give us the download on where he can be reached and uh, where he'll be speaking and, and where folks can go for more information. Got any, any follow-up questions, Chris? No, no, I think he's covered them all. Uh, I, I just find it fascinating how, how this technology does work uh, exactly as I would expect from years ago working with a couple of projects that involve streaming and radio stations and trying to synchronize the, uh, the over-the-air with the, uh, I'll call it the Internet experience. And I'm just fascinated how you know, everybody in the business is more concerned with other methods of trying to marry the two the listener and, and the experience and this radio dns from what i've heard and from what you've ex- your explanation is actually uh, pretty much hit the nail on the head is it would be interesting to see if more people adapt to the next radio tag station combination approach and if radio mm-hmm. dns can gain traction because this would be yeah, the only way I to think- save this would be the only way to if i if i will save the industry from what it's going through because things are getting really bad for for broadcast in the states yeah, I mean, I don't know whether it's going to save the industry, but I think it will certainly make a better user experience for those of us who who really enjoy radio. And you know, at the end of it, it doesn't matter whether you get your radio through the internet or or through broadcast radio, as long as it's a great user experience. You know, and that and that's the important, you know, the important part uh, yeah. to that. Radio DNS is still very very young. You know, it's. Um, uh, I was I was a founder member. I don't actually work for the organisation now, but I was a founder member back in 2008, I think. Um, so it's not been going very long, and it's um, and it's got an, 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 a, a real amount of traction right across the world, which is a, which is a really nice thing to end up seeing. Very good. My head's about to explode, but I it's not going to yet. Um, <laughs> The key website that you mentioned, James, is uh, radiodns.org, and I've already looked that up. Plenty of information at radio at uh, at radiodns.org. Um, that's first stopping yeah, point. Yeah, so there's 
so there's a bunch of information there, um, and I will point you in the in the direction of uh, two more, if I may. Uh, sure. One of them uh, is uh, my own uh, personal website, where um, you can find it's uh, very content light, but you can be, you can find uh, lots of ways of getting in touch. Uh, yeah. And that website address is really easy. It's james.cridland.net, much like my name, but with .net at the end, james.cridland.net. Um, and um, and the one that uh, I use, uh, if you're interested in uh, radio uh, in the UK, um, then um, I, I look after a website called Media UK, which is basically all the information you need to know about radio in the UK. So that's everything from who the radio stations are, what their audience figures are, who's in charge of them, who who the head of music for uh, Capital FM in the in the in the East Midlands is. You know, all of that kind of information is on there. It's entirely free, and it's at mediauk.com, and that's where you'll find me uh, blogging as well. So uh, mediauk.com is a very good website, and I would heartily recommend it. Um, and I just realized that that same. Oh, I'm sorry, that, that same site hosts the uh, article that you pointed me to before the show uh, called Hybrid Radio, What Your Radio Station Needs to Know. And this is a terrific uh, summary of, of what you need to know. I'm going to put this article specifically in the show notes uh, as well. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, fantastic. And I was just going to say um, I will be at both the Rain Summit uh, in Las Vegas and the NAB show. I think I'm speaking on the Wednesday at the Digital Radio Strategies um, uh, conference, um, which your friend Skip has uh, has has uh, helped uh, organise. Um, so I'll be in I'll be in Vegas, and I'm uh, looking for uh, other places to go and to go and see around that 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 uh, week as well. So um, I'd be really I'd be really happy to meet up with anybody who wants to talk more about what the future of radio might be. Super. We've been talking on This Week in Radio Tech to James Cridland from the UK. He's a radio futurologist. And not only does he understand the, the you know, audience and audience behavior concepts and how people really do listen to and consume radio, but the back end, the technical part of that is to how to make that experience better. So we appreciate uh, you, the, the Twit listeners and viewers listening in. And uh, thanks very much to James Cridland. Again, his website is easy, james.cridland.net. And there are links there to uh, all things about him and uh, and the knowledge that he has. Chris Tobin, thank you for uh, making that uh, gar- that big effort, heroic effort, to, to get into the studio this afternoon. I appreciate you being there. Oh, it's nothing heroic. It's just a typical day on the motorway. So you know that's how it goes. <laughs> that's heroic. <laughs> it may not be I've the M six or, or whatnot, but it's definitely uh, <laughs> lots of cars. <laughs> All right. Our show's been brought to you by the Telos ProStream, and uh, that's the box. It's an, uh, uh, an encoding appliance with um, uh, Omni Audio processing built into it. It's really cool. Check it out on the web at telos-systems.com and just look for ProStream. You'll find it there. I'm Kirk Harnack. I hope you'll tune in every week about the same time or grab the podcast. You can always get uh, lots of information, including links to download the audio, watch the video, or subscribe to the podcast. That's the best way to do it. Whatever podcast device that you have, whether it's your PC or an iPhone or uh, an Android phone, I, I happen to use, uh, uh, what is it called, Pod Bucket or something like that. But I, I grab all these podcasts, love them. Uh, you can do all that from uh, the website, the gfqnetwork.com, gfqnetwork.com, uh, or you can go to the original site, thisweekinradiotech.com, where I conveniently copy and paste all the stuff from the GFQ Network website onto ours to keep it all together. So check it out there. You ought to subscribe. It's the best way to go. All right, we'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>